Now, as we've been going through uh, this book, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it really marks uh, the transition in the book from, trans- from positional to practical truth, from doctrine to duty. Uh, in other words, how we're now called to live in light of what we learned in the first three chapters. And in the first three chapters, we learned about uh, how God has, has, has really adopted us, brought us into his family, uh, has gifted us salvation and what all of that entails and the blessings that go along with that. And so now, as we pick up in chapter four, uh, we, we're, we're gonna talk about this morning, what is our response to that? How do we live now in light of that truth? And so Ephesians chapter four, uh, verses one, uh, we'll just start with verse one. It says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay, so, so here's, here's the reality right now. If you are uh, not a Jesus follower and you're watching right now, uh, this is an expectation. That we're going to read here expectations that Jesus followers have and how they're supposed to live. If you are a Jesus follower and you're watching, these are expectations of us. This should be a response uh, to the reality of the gospel uh, in our hearts. And so what Paul, first of all, says, again, because he stated it before earlier in the book, is he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. In other words, he considers his freedom and everything about his life to be chained to the will and the love of God. Okay, so, so everything he does is in sync uh, with what God wants. And so he uses that term uh, because he's actually, well, he's in a physical prison right now, so it's real, but he's saying it's not because of Rome, it's not because of anybody else. I am a, a prisoner, and, and God has sovereignly uh, seen it fit that this is the best way for me to operate and to be used by him. And so I willfully um, lay my life down, and I I am completely uh, surrendered to the will of God, even in chains, even in this. And, and we see him uh, use the word here. He says, I urge you to walk. Now, when he says to urge in this context is not a simple like request. It's a, it's a, it's a plea. He's imploring or begging them. And as we think about um, our lives as a Jesus follower, I should lovingly plead with fellow believers to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, to be everything that the Lord desires for us to be. Walk is is frequently used in the New Testament to refer to daily conduct, the day-by-day living. And we see uh, him talk about here, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now, what is the calling? Well, uh, this calling that is is alluded to is God calling us to himself by his grace. So this is the gospel that has been uh, literally handed down to us. It was reached to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ and him freely offering us uh, that um, is so powerful. It's such an incredible calling when we think about the reality that God didn't just make salvation available. He didn't just do that incredible work and say, this is an option. No, Jesus said he came to seek and to save. In other words, he came down here to look to bring it to people, to deliver it, to deliver this incredible calling. So this calling is called a high calling. Uh, In Hebrews chapter three, verse one, it's called a heavenly calling. In 2 Timothy 1, 9, it's called a holy calling. And so we are now to live in light of that privileged calling. We're to live a life that is worthy of that. Now, uh, the Greek uh, word that, that we get from worthy, it has, it has the root meaning of balancing the scales. So what's on one side of the scale should be equal to what's on the other side. So the word was applied to anything that was expected to correspond to something else. So a a person worthy of their pay was one whose work corresponded to their wages. In other words, how they work uh, matched how they were paid. It aligned. Uh, It measured out equally on the scale. And so the believer who walks in a manner worthy of their calling is one whose daily living matches their spiritual position. 
Okay, so how I live my daily life should align and match on that scale with the incredible position that I have before God. In other words, to live according to who you are in Christ. Um, I was meeting with this young adult, and this young adult had a, had, had a famous father. And, and so we were talking about the weight that he felt knowing that there were expectations for him to measure up to who his father was and how other people had these expectations. He felt the weight of that even from his own family, knowing that, that this famous person is his dad. And, and he was just wrestling through, like, how do I measure up to that? Like, like what are people going to think? Oh, uh, he's actually worthy of that name by how he's lived his life. And, and so he just wrestled through what, what qualifies as me meeting that. And I think when we, when we actually look at this verse, we initially go, man, well, how in the world can I live up to that, like, that incredible standing? Like, how in the world can I live up to this calling, this position that God in his sovereignty has blessed me and allowed me to, to be at? Like, how do I do that? And this is the beauty of the Bible. God doesn't just say, hey, here's the standard. Good luck with that. No, he maps it out. He, he tells us how we can live that reflects our lives being worthy of that calling. And that's what he begins with in verse two. It says this, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So now Paul explains what character qualities are necessary to walk worthy. And he's he's starting with humility, which isn't surprising because humility is an essential characteristic of believers all throughout scripture. We see this. We, I mean, think about it. We can't even praise God or please him. We can't even enter into a relationship with him without humility because the very nature of me entering into a relationship with Jesus is me acknowledging that I'm unworthy, that I can't save myself. So I come to him humbly knowing that he has to step in and intervene on my behalf. See, Jesus was the supreme example of humility. In Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight, it says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So he came to earth as God's son, yet he was born in a stable, raised in a peasant family, never owned any property other than the clothes on his back, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. If he walked in humility while on earth, how much more should we as his followers? Humility allows us to see ourselves as we really are because it shows us before God as he is. So, so it begins with an honest, unedited, unphotoshopped view of ourselves before God. You know, as we study Jesus' life in the Gospels, we see his human perfection. You see how he lived life as a human to complete perfection. But as you continue to study, what, what really stands out, it goes much beyond his human perfection. What we see is his divine perfection. We see his power, his authority to heal, uh, to cast out demons. We see uh, the, the power to forgive uh, sins. And what we uh, do, what we come to by studying and seeing his divine power and that perfection is one, we're brought to this place of awe and we begin to see Jesus Christ just as Isaiah saw himself before Jesus uh, in Isaiah chapter six, verse five, when he's confronted with this reality, uh, when he has this vision and sees the Lord and, and what it does like is it brings humility. It's a byproduct of this. Isaiah 6, 5, it says, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, when Paul looked at himself in light of who God is uh, and, and had this incredible self-awareness, he saw himself as the chief of all sinners. 
When Peter was able to look at himself in relation to God and he experiences the power of Jesus in this miracle uh, that Jesus performed and them catching all this fish. In Luke chapter five, verse eight, Peter says this, but when Simon Peter saw, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So he's brought, like when you are, are, are brought into the presence, the power of God, it, it knocks you to your knees. It humbles you. It's a byproduct. Even Job, after he suffered, after he's questioned, after he's listened to all this horrible advice from his friends and just gone through stuff that you and I can't even imagine somebody going through, he says this in Job chapter 42, verse 6. Who is, he's just suffered. And, and, and before the presence and the power of God, he says, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So when we are brought before this perfect, almighty, powerful God, and we see it all throughout scripture, we are not in that place going, oh, look at me, man, look at how you've blessed me. Look at how gifted I am. Look at how good I, no, no, no. You are literally brought to the reality of how small you are. You're brought to the reality of the condition of your heart, the sinful uh, nature inside. All these things are revealed in you because you're overwhelmed by the nature and the power of a perfect God, and you're standing before him. One author puts it this way, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. That's what happens when you are daily brought before God. And that's what we need to do as Jesus followers. The term humility was uncommon in first century Greek literature. When it did appear, uh, it was used with a negative connotation. So Greeks and Romans, they viewed humility, like they mocked humility. And in particular, Christians, they would mock them for their humility. Uh, it, it was something that they devalued. Uh, pride was the thing that, that they valued above all. And, and when you look at our culture, even today, our culture looks down at humility. And what does it do? It exalts pride. See, like, like we, say, we, say, we say this, pamper yourself, right? Like take care of uh, yourself. Think about yourself uh, first. Um, you know, like, like think of ways to get yourself in front of more people. And, and what we look at this is, man, we go, man, that's actually the problem here. See, you only think of yourself. Many of us find ourselves right now and the only person we've been filtering all these world events through, all these things that haven't worked out through is how they make me feel. And so pride, when we look at the core, pride means being filled with self. And in this world, listen, as you focus, as you exalt yourself, as you take care of yourself, as you highlight yourself, this world, and this is what's dangerous, this world will applaud you for that. It will elevate you for that. You'll get more followers on social media for that. All these things. But when we look at the opposite of humility, it's pride. And the first sin we see is pride. And every sin that we see since then has come out of pride. Pride led, led the angel Lucifer to exalt himself above his creator. Uh, in Ezekiel 28, 17, uh, it says, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. This is talking about Lucifer, this angel. And what are words that it describes here? That, that your heart was proud because of your beauty. You, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, okay? You went, man, I am good. Man, I am beautiful. Man, like, like look at all these things I am. And guess what? There is only one I am, and you and I are not him. And so this angel Lucifer, this incredible, mighty, powerful angel becomes Satan. Pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So pride leads to destruction. God's gonna oppose that. He's not about that. 
See, and we're tempted to be proud of our abilities, our possessions, our education, our social status, our appearance, uh, the power we have, even our biblical knowledge or, or religious accomplishments. We become prideful of those things. And it's so easy to fall into that tempta- temptation. And our only protection against pride is a proper view of God. Pride's the sin of competing with God. Humility's the virtue of submitting to God. As I submit to God, I start considering others more important than myself, and that's when humility brings unity. Humility brings unity when out of that humility, you start to look around and you start to value other people even more than yourself. And that's a byproduct of you spending time with God. So humility, uh, we, we read uh, later on in that same verse, humility produces another thing. It produces gentleness or meekness uh, is what maybe uh, your translation says. But uh, we look at this word gentleness or meekness and the meaning has nothing to do with weakness or being timid or cowardice. Like, like listen, this word, it means the opposite of that, really. It was used of wild animals, that were tamed, uh, and especially horses that were broken and trained. Okay, so the horse still has its strength, but its will is under the control of its master. Okay, so the horse can run just as fast, but it runs only when and where its master tells it to run. Biblical meekness or gentleness is power under the control of God. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter seen these soldiers coming, what does Peter do? We looked at this last week. Peter literally pulls out a sword and he's about to defend Jesus. And what does Jesus tell him in Matthew 26, 53? He literally says, put that away. Do you not know that I could just ask my father right now and he could send legions or thousands of angels down here this very instant? Put that away. And we see also in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, first in 28, Jesus says, come to me. And then later on in verse 29, he says something that, you know what? We don't really highlight with him. He says, I am gentle. Come to me. I am gentle. Even in his humanity, Jesus had access to divine power, which he could at any time utilize for his own defense, yet not once did he choose to do so. His refusal to those divine resources for anything but obeying his father's will is the supreme picture of meekness. It's power under control. You know, David in 1 Samuel 24, uh, he displayed this as well when King Saul, who's trying to find him and kill him, uh, King Saul has to go to the restroom. And so he chooses this cave to go and he's there by himself. And David and his men are hiding in that cave. And David's own men are like, hey, there he is, the guy trying to kill you. You have literally already been, uh, you know, uh, you've been ordained as the next king and all of that. Like you've been anointed. It's your time. Okay, there it is. God has handed uh, him to you and David refuses to do so. Power under control, meekness. Moses was described as the meekest man on the face of the earth in Numbers chapter 12, verse three. And yet he was a dynamic leader who challenged the power in the throne of Egypt. We see even in 1 Timothy 3, 3, qualifications for elders, like a requirement is this, that you are not violent, but it says gentle. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit, we read. It's the way we're also called to care for one another. In Galatians 6, 1, uh, it, it says this, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So you are to meet someone where they're at and restore them in a spirit of gentleness, it says. See, a meek person isn't avenging. A meek person isn't saying, I told you so. They're not self-assertive. They're not, they're not the one that's getting all defensive over things and getting worked up. See, their anger is controlled. 
It's not this careless, emotional rage that they unleash and bystanders are just getting hit with this. Like, like no, because what we see is one of the true marks of this meekness, of this gentleness is self-control, is power under control. A third attitude that characterizes the Christian's worthy walk is patience. How are you doing with that right now? I don't know about you, but I am not hitting that one out of the park at this moment. When I think of just patience right now, man, every day I find myself struggling, being impatient. When is this gonna end? When are we gonna be out of this? And, and it's even worse because you're getting mixed signals from different things and different news outlets and different leaders. And, and then, and then you, you, you turn and you look. And I, I, for me, I have multiple boys who are trying to do school and they're trying to do school online. And so they've got these like tablets up and now, and now I'm impatient with that technology. Now I'm impatient with my internet speed. Now I'm impatient with this app that I've never used before. And, and now I'm impatient with my kids and how they're, how they're doing it. And then I'm impatient with their teachers and all of, and if you're a teacher, by the way, we love you. We're praying for you. We want to bless you. Man, it's tough. Okay. We get that. But I just find that I am struggling with this patience. Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 4, he says, love is patient. So to love somebody else, God's way is patient. To have patient love, we must endure challenges over a period of time. See, patience is sometimes translated as long-suffering. The patient person endures negative or, or delayed circumstances or results, right? They're able to weather through that with optimism because of their relationship with God. See, Abraham himself, he received the promise of God, but he had to wait, as Hebrews uh, tells us, he had to wait many years. But because he waited so well, he endured and was rewarded. God told Noah to build this ship in a place, in a desert, where there was no body of water anywhere near, where rain had never even been on the earth at that point in time. And for 120 years, Noah is building this and he's preaching judgment to all his neighbors. You wanna talk about patience. James chapter five, uh, verse 10, it says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And so we go, okay, let's look at the prophets. Well, when God called Jeremiah, he told the prophet that no one would believe his message and that he would be hated, maligned, and persecuted. Yet we see Jeremiah serve the Lord faithfully and patiently until the end of his life. When God called Isaiah, he was told that the nation would not listen to him nor would they turn from their sin and respond to his teaching or preaching. And like Jeremiah, he preached and ministered with patient faithfulness. And what you see here when we talk about patience, this is not just patience with God, right? That's hard enough. What makes it even harder is it's patience with other people who are against you or that are in the way of what you're trying to accomplish. And that's where it gets really, really difficult for us right? Because we're dealing with patience on multiple fronts right now. It's like patience with God. God, you're sovereign. You're, in all, you're all controlling. And then we're trying to deal with patience with other people, right? That aren't helping us or they're in the way or they're not responding when we wish they would. And the question is always this, how do I cultivate patience? Well, one, I always say, hey, don't pray for it. <laughs> but how do we cultivate it? By relying on the Spirit because it's a fruit of the Spirit. So it's a byproduct of me walking with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit. Patience is going to come out of that. The other thing that helps us cultivate it is by meditating on the patience that Jesus has shown you. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, that, that all should reach repentance. Aren't you thankful for that patience that he demonstrated to you? And I tell you what, when I think of the patience, and for some of us, man, he's been really patient. When you think of that patient, guess what? It helps you to be patient with other people as well talked about bearing with one another in love, right? It talked about bearing with one another in love. And, and what that means is to put up with each other in love. Peter in, in 1 Peter 4, 8, 
says this, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Okay, so, so love, it literally, it, it puts a blanket on all of these sins. I, if you've ever been cold at night and you're like, man, I need a blanket. Listen, you putting a blanket on yourself, it doesn't, like, like, it doesn't mean, oh, I was never uh, cold in the first place. No, the blanket helps you deal with the cold in a productive way. It helps you warm up. And when you think about what love does uh, when, um, when we think about being wronged or we think about uh, somebody doing something in opposition and you extend love to them, He's saying this doesn't cover it up. In other words, it doesn't uh, make it so that, oh, that never happened uh, or that didn't hurt. He's not negating that or saying that. What he's saying is what love can do is, is something that other things can't. In other words, it can take that. It can cover it to where uh, th- that sin doesn't have to become all it could be without love. It helps take that sin and turn it in a way to where you know something productive can come out of it through Christ's love. And so we're called to love that way. Like your marriage, you have to do this daily in your marriage, right? You have a choice because your spouse hurts you, says things, uh, does things, that, that, and, and, and you have a choice to respond to that. And a great marriage responds what? Even in love, even when it's been wronged. When you think about us as Jesus followers and our relationship really uh, living out and modeling this incredible love that he talks about, this love that puts up with each other, this, this love that bears with one another. When he's talking about this, the only way to do that is to pursue it even when it doesn't make sense, even when you've been wrong, even when someone else doesn't deserve the love that God calls you to offer them. And what I always, like what it always brings me back to is Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. I love this verse. I say this verse all the time. God demonstrates his love towards us. Why, how? While we were still sinners, he died for us. In other words, like God extended his love, just like this love, First Peter 4 is talking about. God extended his love while you were still in denial of him, while you were still choosing to be in opposition to him. He still went to the cross, extending out unconditional love to you, making his love available to you. And so we're called now to bring love in that way to other people. And it, it's, it's a love that's unqualified. It's unselfish. It, it willingly gives whether it receives in return or not. It's a love that prays for its persecutors. And then in verse three here, as he, as he closes this little section, it says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So the outcome and these qualities, uh, these characteristics, they all build off each other, right? Starting with humility. But we see the outcome of these qualities is eagerness to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, it says. So eager to keep unity. So unity is, is active. It's not some passive thing and we should be zealous to maintain it. Notice, uh, and this is really important. Notice, we do not work to create unity. It says our, our calling is to maintain it. The Holy Spirit is the one who unites us. He's the one who creates unity. We're just called to maintain it by his help. It's this unity that Jesus prayed for before his betrayal and arrest in John chapter 17. Listen to these words in verses 21 through 23. He says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Okay, did you hear that? (laughs) Over and over again as he's talking to his father, a prayer for oneness for his followers. So my responsibility as a Jesus follower is to eagerly preserve the unity by faithfully walking in a manner worthy of God's calling. So when I see or hear things that are unraveling the unity that he's designed and created, I need to be proactive and engage in that and correct that. And as a leader, I have to, I have to model this. 
Like, like as, as a pastor, if, if I see or hear uh, individuals or situations that are causing uh, the unity of the Holy Spirit to be unraveled, man, I better be proactive in addressing that. I mean, we gotta do everything we can to protect that, to continue to create an environment that cultivates that. The bond that preserves unity, it says, is peace. And what is peace? Well, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. It's, it, we talk about this peace. It's the spiritual belt that it's talking about. It's the spiritual belt that surrounds and binds God's people together. And be, behind this bond of peace, just like behind all of this, is what? It's love. This all comes back to love. In Colossians 3.14, it says, and above all these, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. See, we need peace, maybe now more than ever. And I wanna encourage you to have this posture, this mindset. It starts with me and you. It starts with us. You know, I don't know about you, but as I watch what's going on, I find myself being very critical of other people. I find uh, that I'm wanting to fix other people. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to know, is that truth? Are you saying the truth? And, 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 and why are you, you know, why are you doing that? Or what's your agenda here? And all these things. And I am reminded with scripture as I come before a perfect and almighty powerful God that it needs to start with the humility in me that he wants to bring in me. And that I need to focus on myself working, living in a manner that is worthy of the calling right, that balances out the scale. See, these virtues and the supernatural unity to which they protect and project is the most powerful testimony the church can have because it's in such contrast to the mindset and disunity of our world. It's exactly what the world's crying out for. And I've been just reminded of this. Like, like, like it, it's literally the message that I've been hearing from God as I've been spending time with him is not, hey, Steve, you know, just kind of take a break, try and figure things out, try and wrap your mind around all this. No, it's the message is needed now more than ever. And, and Jesus followers need to be living this worthy calling more than ever. And you wanna think about like, like if we did this, if we live this out, what it's talking about, in this worthy way, in this unified way, this is the best way for a door to be open to the gospel message for so many people. Because like I said, everything this is talking about right now is in opposition to what the world is doing. And yet the world is crying out for this. And literally, like, like you want a platform to present the gospel. Live this out. Do this. Treat other Jesus followers this way. Live in light of this incredible calling that you've been called with. And as we pursue these qualities and reject the opposite of these qualities, here's what's so awesome. God continues to give us the map, right? God doesn't just say, here's a destination. Figure out how to get there. Figure out how to arrive at this place where you're living a life that's worthy of this incredible calling. No, he says, do this, do this, and do this. He says, if you implement this into your life, if you take these qualities, if you will walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with what? All humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, you will have an incredible reach. You will arrive at the, at, at the destination a nation that is God's best for your life and you will have the impact that he's designed for you and I to have and that is a incredible rewarding feel feeling and but the choice is us will we respond and that's what I want to challenge you with this morning respond because when you type in that destination on your phone and it pulls up on your GPS it's giving you the answer but I think for some of us we're like no I know or I got this, I don't need that. And we find ourselves starting to struggle, starting to take turns that we don't need to, starting to question some things and walking in a way that doesn't align with what is worthy of this incredible standing that we have with God. As sons and daughters adopted, giving all the blessings of all the, the heavenlies it talks about, 
that's, he wants us to live in this incredible freedom. That's why he came to seek and to save. Let's live in light of that incredible blessing, the calling that we get to have as Jesus followers. And if you've never made a decision, I want you to think about, you know, where do you go to in this time? And what does it look like to live worthy? And, and, and who defines that for you?